The second meditation is subtitled The Nature of the Human Mind and How It is Better Known Than the Body and takes place the day after the first meditation. The meditator is firm and is resolved to continue his search for certainty and to discard as false anything that is open to the slightest doubt. He recalls Archimedes' famous saying that he could shift the entire earth given one immovable point. Similarly, he hopes to achieve great things if he can be certain of just one thing. Recalling the previous meditation, he supposed that what he sees does not exist, that his memory is faulty, that he has no senses and no body, that extension, movement and place are mistaken notions. Perhaps, he remarks, the only certain thing remaining is that there is no certainty. Then he wonders, is not he the source of these meditations, not something? He has conceded that he has no senses and no body, but does that mean he cannot exist either? He has also noted that the physical world does not exist, which might also seem to imply his non-existence. And yet to have these doubts, he must exist. For an evil demon to mislead him in all these insidious ways, he must exist in order to be misled. There must be an I that can doubt, be deceived and so on. He formulates the famous Kogito saying, Kogito argument saying, so after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. The meditator's next question then is what this I that exists is. He initially thought that he had a soul by means of which he was nourished, moved, could sense and think, and also that he had a body. All these attributes have been cast into doubt except one. He cannot doubt that he thinks. He may exist without any other of the above attributes, but he cannot exist if he does not think. Further, he only exists as long as he is thinking. Therefore, thought above all else is inseparable from being. The meditator concludes that in the strict sense, he is only a thing that thinks. The meditator tries to clarify precisely what this I is, this thing that thinks. He concludes that he is not only something that thinks, understands and wills, but is also something that imagines and senses. After all, he may be dreaming or de deceived by an evil demon, but he can still imagine things and he still seems to hear and see things. His sensory perceptions may not be vertical, but they are certainly a part of the same mind that thinks. The meditator then moves on to ask how he comes to know of this, I. The senses, as we have seen, cannot be trusted. Similarly, he concludes that he cannot trust the imagination. The imagination can conjure up ideas of all sorts of things that are not real, so it cannot be the guide to knowing his own essence. Still, the meditator remains puzzled. If, as he has concluded, he is a thinking thing, why is it that he has such a distinct grasp of what his body is and has such a difficult time in identifying what this I is that thinks? In order to understand this difficulty, he considers how we come to know of a piece of wax just taken from a honeycomb, through the senses or by some other means. He first considers what he can know about the piece of wax by means of the senses, its, its uh, smell, taste, color, shape, size, hardness, etc. The meditator then asks what happens when the piece is taken near a fire. It melts. All of these sensible qualities change so that, for instance, it is now soft when before it was hard. Nonetheless, the same piece of wax still remains. Our knowledge that the solid piece of wax and the melted piece of wax are the same cannot come through the senses since all of its sensible properties have changed. The meditator con considers what he can know about the piece of wax and concludes that he can know only that it is extended, flexible and changeable. He does not come to know this through the senses and realizes that it is impossible that he comes to know the wax by means of the imagination. The wax can change into an infinite number of different shapes and he cannot run through all these shapes in his imagination. Instead, he concludes he knows the wax by means of the intellect alone. His mental perception of it can either be imperfect and confused as when he allowed herself to be led by his senses and imagination or it can be clear and distinct, as it is when he applies only careful mental scrutiny to his perception of it. The meditator reflects on how easy it is to be deceived regarding these matters. After all, we might say, I see the wax, though in saying that we refer to the wax as the intellect perceives it, 
rather than to its color or shape. This is similar to the way in which we might see people down in the street when all we really see are coats and hats. Our intellect and not our eyes judge that judges that there are people and not automata under those coats and hats. The meditator concludes that, contrary to his initial impulses, the mind is a far better knower than the body. Further, he suggests he must know his mind far better than other things. After all, as he has admitted, he may not be perceiving the piece of wax at all. It may be a dream or an illusion. But when he is perceiving the piece of wax, he cannot doubt that he is perceiving nor that he is judging what he perceives to be a piece of wax, and both of these acts of thought imply that he exists. Every thought we might have about the world outside us can only doubtfully be true of the outside world, but it must with certainty confirm our own existence and establish the nature of our own mind. The meditator happily concludes that he can know at least that he thinks, that he is a thinking thing, that his mind is better known than his body, and that all clear and distinct perceptions come by means of the intellect alone and not the senses or the imagination.